Minneapolis and Twin Cities in general are incredibly accessible. There's this really amazing balance between a practical lifestyle with a certain level of refinement. You can't get that experience in any other city where people will actually want to talk to you and invite you over, but at the same time be able to have a similar type of aesthetic experience as you do in like in LA or in New York or in London. I think a lot of times the Midwest is seen as a flyover state, especially creatively. I think that we really work hard to change that mindset. For us, it's like, how do we identify the values of here while helping them become aesthetically, strategically, part of the world conversation. Bodega is a multidisciplinary creative firm. So we do everything from interior design, branding, photography, and styling. The name Bodega really came from the idea of a corner store and a place where you can get all of the things you need for your day and you have human interactions and sort of just like your anchor. We found that a lot of creative agencies like silo every discipline, but then it's hard to scale creativity in that way. That's kind of what we specialize in, how all of those parts come together as a whole. When we first met, we talked about how both of our dreams was to make things with our significant other, how that's the ultimate trust. It allows for a certain depth of work. In the day to day, a lot of our time working is spent sitting next to each other, working on our respective kind of parts of the Venn diagram, communicating, especially when those parts overlap. So there's a lot of room for autonomy in terms of each person's expertise. What she does affects what I do, and my ideas can make her ideas better. A lot of the inspiration that we get comes from sort of our opposite aesthetics. Things that Joseph responds to are slightly antagonistic. They're edgier. A lot of the things that I respond to are a little bit more classical. I like beauty. This camera was my grandparents when they lived in France. Now I use it in photo shoots because it's beautiful. Inspiration can come from a lot of different places. It's really just curation, collecting intentionally. This is our mood board for Borderland, which is an ongoing furniture and product development project. I love like old stationery, so I found these in like a Secondhand shop. This is a piece of inspiration that I found that I really love. It's like all these old fabric swatches that are from a trimmings company in Minneapolis. These are definitely inspiration. Our clients are really <laughs> open to me and all of my interesting um, bits and pieces that I collect. That kind of collecting, I think, is at the core of how we find inspiration. We're very fortunate to have the clients that we have. Hi. We work with people versus for them, and they understand that. Are you good? Good. 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 How are you guys? Today we're meeting with our clients, Ryan and Sabrina of Otabo. We're going to work through some of our plans for Borderland. We want to treat the furniture like, yeah. I mean, they're unique, individual, like fine pieces of art. In the early days of Bodega, we had all of our capabilities listed on our website. And then we started getting all these inquiries that were really boring. I need this one thing and that one thing only and I'm not willing to talk about anything else. But we took all that down and we let our work be the main drive for the website. So then that allowed us to kind of field anything and then be whatever we needed to be for that client. I think it would be worth looking at the pieces behind us to kind of get a feel for some of the textures. I, mean, I like the idea of making a lot of these things a part of our normal lives, right? right? Yeah. Clients say, I'm not really sure what it is I want from you, but I, I just know I need to have it. You know, here's the goal, but how do we get there? And we actually got to be a part of creating what the solution was versus just being handed like the finish line, I guess. Maison Bodega is a hundred year old building that we are renovating and turning into our live workspace. It's a really good reflection of our process and how we look at projects. 
understanding where something has come from and where it's going at the same time. We've done a lot of work on this house. Yeah, we've taken off old wallpaper, one layer or six layers. We've taken out gnarly old paneling. Yep. <laughs> we've refurbished windows. We've jackhammered out four or five inches of concrete downstairs to prep for the terrazzo mix that you designed. The building being from 1920 was a, a creative hub. There's also a women's club and magazine run through here as well. So what we're trying to do is understand where it came from, take that energy and take it forward into the future and make sure everything is done right. With this project specifically, with every detail that we're being really thoughtful and intentional about, we're able to tie all of those up to kind of a bigger overarching concept and idea that's really rooted in stewardship and preservation and that intentionality means a lot. We try and sell big ideas to clients, so then to really sell that through, you have to live that lifestyle as well. So for us, it's like, how big can we go? And let's just go for it, kind of the way we started Bodega. Let's take that risk, because we can only take this risk once, and we're kind of doing that again. Let's go for it, you know? I was a tomboy, I was outside all day. I built dozens and dozens and dozens of forts. We were just outside all the time. One of those kids I got on a bike at nine in the morning on a summer day and came home just in time for dinner. It feels like a cliche to say, you know, my source of inspiration is nature. I have reverence for nature. I would say that's the word is reverence. I really feel like Mother Nature has solved most problems, and so I just think it's infinitely inspiring. Oh, that's really, really pretty. See these ferns are curling on the ends. I, oh my gosh, I've never seen that. I bet it's only gonna last one day. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna try and photograph this, but there's a possibility if I snip a, a frond that they'll like go limp as soon as I do. That's crazy pretty. I really got into photography when, um, in college when I was given a SLR camera. And then I started doing visual journaling, sort of like sketching, collaging. Sugar, sugar wrappers in France, ca French cafes. <laughs> so it just slowly added as the kids got older and I got more free time, I could add more and more creative outlets to my life. I don't know if I want to do that. Ooh, that's good. Steve and I, my husband Steve, we've always thought that we would retire into a creative career. He's always had ambitions to be a writer. I always had ambitions to be a photographer, visual artist, collage artist, or painter. We would sort of set ourselves up. We'd prepare to be creative in our, in our retirement. A lot of people were doing these project a days and they're very popular and they've launched tons of artists. Um, and I thought, I want to do something like that. It didn't take long to look around my house and see, you know, you know, the bowl full of rocks from Lake Superior and the bowl full of sea glass from the Mediterranean. Without even realizing it, that I was a nature collector, what I collect is nature. Color family. Some nice shadows, I think, actually. Give it some depth. I just feel like there's too much stimulus today. There's too much stuff coming in. There's too much advertising and too much color and it's too loud and it's too bright. So for me, still was this quiet place. You know, it's white on white. It's very quiet. You look at one thing, it's usually floating on the white background because I, you know, I just wanted it to be calm and people have responded to that. It's a quirky nature blog from Shoreview, Minnesota, but it hit a nerve, it hit a zeitgeist that people like the calm of the images. C 
seed pods and bugs. And this is what I call delicate bits. Yeah, eucalyptus seed pods. These are from wild grapevines here. Beetle-eaten leaves, sometimes called skeleton leaves. My process can be repeated, but my portfolio can't now. Those ferns that we just photographed today with their little droopy tips, I, I've never seen that before. I may not see it again, you know. Jack, Jack, good boy, good boy. The blog has been an absolute life enhancer. Like I can, I can take my walk in the morning, I can photograph my subject in the afternoon and I can edit it at night. And I think that's part of the reason the daily blog challenge became a life enhancer because it never became a life detractor. It never got in the way. I did it as a creative challenge. It was to have a creative exercise so I could grow as an artist. But what happened, what I did not expect is that it became part of our family lifestyle. The whole family, we're all naturalists now. When I'm creating, I can get into deep play where I can lift up my head and two hours have gone by and it felt like a minute. I can imagine doing this forever because nature is infinitely varied and I won't ever exhaust it and it's not, it won't get boring. I could study it, I could photograph it, I could document it for the rest of my life. Quilling is actually described as the art of paper filigree. Traditionally, artists use paper strips and they would coil it up and make shapes out of it. But instead of doing that, my way of quilling is to just use the paper strip and to almost like sketch with paper. I like paper because it's something that I'm familiar with and it's something that everyone can relate to. I've always been artistic since I was a kid. I love working with my hands. And I think that being in architecture school and the studio environment, that really helped. I was born in Singapore. But then I decided to go to college for architecture at Cornell University. I initially thought architecture was a good balance of like being creative as well as like a little bit of engineering. I kind of like that idea of like being artistic and practical at the same time. When we moved to the Twin Cities, I knew I didn't want to do architecture anymore just because I never was really passionate about it. So I started doing paper art two years ago, and I guess now I'm a paper artist. I work under the name Judith and Rose, which is a combination of my middle name and my husband's middle name. Oh, that's cool. I do like to say we when referring to my artwork because I feel like Jamie has had a say in it. So even though he's not the one physically putting the paper down, gluing the paper down, you know, his ideas are in it, his criticisms are in it, and I like to give him credit. I like to call myself a self-taught artist because I didn't go to art school. When I first started, I made it a point to not look at videos online of how other artists were doing quilling or paper art, because I think the process of making something, it's unique and it's personal. Since, you know, I already had that foundation in architecture school, I felt like it was important to find my own way of doing things. And so how I work might not necessarily be how some other artists work, but it works for me, and I think that's important. My aesthetic is clean and modern. I don't like anything too fussy. It's difficult to do simple. Something that looks easy could take hours, days, weeks. The first paper art pieces that I made were names with these coils of paper, and they were actually gifts for our friends and family for their babies. Yeah, it started out being way more personal, and then now I'm trying to grow as an artist. We were just in a group exhibition in California. It was a group of paper artists, and I actually was the only quilling artist. It was the first time that our work has been shown in the US in a gallery setting. 
So we actually had a chance to go visit, and my parents actually came to visit and got to see the show, which I think must have been interesting for them because in their mind, they still think I'm an architect. You know, I sent my daughter to architecture school. What is she doing? <laughs> so it was nice to see that I possibly have a career in art. It's like gratifying to see a work on the wall. process is much like this meandering circle of excitement and sort of the fear and you know feelings of inadequacy and then you know total excitement again. I know that I'm in good territory if I feel lost um, and I know now that I have to work through those feelings of I don't know what I'm doing or this thing is terrible to get to the other side. I'm a graphic designer by trade, and design has always been something I really enjoy. Making something's been always something I really enjoy. And the business piece sort of followed along. So I've let my love for making things stay alongside me as new opportunities in social media and product development have come along. I would say my aesthetic is a mixture between classic and modern. Um, I love that tension where two different styles meet and there's a kind of energy in, um, in mixing and matching. It's a lot of high and low, it's a lot of mixed materials, there's a little bit of patina on things and that everything looks really good against a white wall. It's an inspiration wall. So it's where we just put up stuff that we are liking, um, things that we've made, things that we feel we could come back to. And so these are all things that just inspire the, the product line and art direction. And, and sometimes we put up products we've designed and say, oh yeah, it doesn't really like, feel like it fits in our world. Um, sometimes we like it anyway and keep it. So impetus for Wit and Delight, I started it in late 2008 when the stock market was going crazy and I was worried about losing my job. And I thought, might as well deal with the anxiety by, you know, betting on myself. When I started the website, I was trying to figure out, you know, really basic things like how do I, how do we create an apartment that I'm proud of and love living in on a shoestring budget? And I found that all the things that I was gravitating towards were beautiful, but they also were smart. And that's where the name of the company really came from. It was a blog. Um, I designed it myself. I coded it myself. It crashed all the time. At the time, there was lots of pink and sparkles, and a lot of the feminine sites were really wonderful and fun to read, but they didn't necessarily speak to my aesthetic. And so I thought, maybe I have something unique to say that isn't as girly, um, that maybe a little bit more understated. And maybe there are other women who feel that way too. And it turns out that was true. wrote about design and, you know, decor from 2009 until probably about 2013 when I decided to bring sort of a lifestyle aspect that didn't have to do with material things that had a lot more to do with how you view the things in your world and how you were treating yourself and mental health became a, a huge platform um, and topic for us to champion and things really changed when we began to talk about being good to yourself so you can live a better life. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. So these are affirmation cards, um, which essentially they come with a little stand. So you can like put them on your desk or like in your bathroom or whatever. And they're essentially like little reminders. Um, let your mind run free is one for my wild brain. That it's okay to let that happen. Um, check in your negativity at the door. Um, when you're feeling shame, remembering that you're totally enough right now. Um, keep doing you. Um, less ego, more empathy, which is perfect for this day and age. Um, no one is as perfect as they appear. Oh, this is my favorite. <laughs> Put your phone down. <laughs> the journals that I keep and the sketchbooks that I keep have been a long-standing way for me to deal with ADD. 
I was kind of riffing off an idea of ways I'm feeling, you know, this is probably anxiety, this is probably when ADD is feeling really, really good, and this is, this is probably um, my ADD on steroids. Becoming more open about my anxiety and depression is uh, probably a parallel path to me understanding exactly the role it played in my life. I felt that all of these things that were really weighing me down and holding me back suddenly became assets. My ADD became this wonderful way of having incredible speed and creativity. My anxiety kept me from running my business amok. Um, my depression um, was, a, was essentially a way of saying that you've gone too far and you need to take a break. And that's when I really realized, okay, if, if I've taken like the most, this diagnosis that I've been so shameful of and realized all the benefits of it and I realize how to live with it, I have a responsibility to share that with people. Especially if we're writing about designing a life well lived. Like you can't, you can't design your life around having material things save you from who you really are. Um, and so figuring out how to use your flaws to live a better life. You can't sort of deny those things and everyone I think has a reckoning at some point to say this is who I am, flaws and all, and how do I learn to embrace them more to, you know, live in a way that really fulfills me. Growing up, Art was always a big part of my life. I grew up uh, sketching, drawing, painting. I did theater throughout high school and in college and uh, eventually found my way to photography. I started my Instagram account when it first launched and it was just a tool and an app for me to just kind of put out personal photographs. And over time, I started getting inquiries about shooting for other people or for other projects and wanting me to either work on their visual content for their social media feeds or actually work on different campaigns. And so in 2010, I decided to take a leap of faith and started Canary Gray. I work with different brands on visual content. Uh, I work with different lifestyle brands, work with publications with shooting editorial content, and I work with uh, architectural firms shooting interior and exterior spaces. Not perfect. My aesthetic is more minimal, I would say. I'm attracted to the simple lines and shapes and the composition of an image. You know, when I'm shooting landscapes, I really like looking at it more from an abstract point of view. I love using negative space. There's something about that that highlights the point of view. Yeah, and I like it's more neutral than just yeah. having the floor there. Yeah. I really enjoy working with clients in more than just a photographer capacity. I really want to be hands-on and, and work with my clients on their overall art direction and even help style if I need to. I love your face right now. I'll just stay right there. I like you looking down. Awesome. Okay, got it. I think with finding photography later in my life it helped me become a stronger photographer and a stronger artist because I had other foundations in art. By then I had honed in on some more technical skills too. Got it. In the past couple years, I've been working on more personal projects and I've wanted to pursue uh, putting out more fine art photography. Uh, it's an evolution that is something that I've always wanted to do as an artist. A couple of the projects that I've been working on are from some of our personal travels. One common thread is nature. In particular, when we were in Norway, we hiked to Trolltunga, which was the most incredible and crazy thing I've done ever. <laughs> but I was so inspired by the landscape over there and like not the obvious beauty of 
the view that you got from the top, but I was really inspired by the geological formations. What excites me the most, I'll be able to tell my own stories. Um, a lot of my work that I've done for other people I'm really proud of, but there was always a little piece of me that was missing in that, and I've really wanted to put out more personal work. And so it's a big leap of faith, like starting Canary Grey, that I'm excited to pursue and, and finally put out, put out my own photography and my own art. <gasps> C is for cat and D is for dinosaur. Since having Odin, it's been easier to say no <laughs> to things. It's really made me realize what matters. I want to take on work that excites me and makes me happy. And there's work that, that does do that. And so saying yes to those is easy, but then saying no to things that just don't make sense or matter or that take time away from him. It's easier to say no to those things. That's impacted me the most, I would say. This program is made possible by the state's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.